Welcome to the Massage Therapy Podcast. I'm Heather Rivers, registered massage therapist. And I'm Nicole Andrews, registered massage therapist and contemporary medical acupuncturist. We're colleagues with almost 13 years of combined experience and small business owners who have a passion for health and wellness. So grab your cup of tea, kick up your feet, and enjoy today's episode. Today's topic, we wanted to kick up our feet a little bit and have an informal discussion on our experiences working for others, working in multiple, multiple discipline. I can't even talk today. Working in multidisciplinary <laughs> clinics. There we go. And uh, going it alone. So yeah. So we really wanted to just take a take a really casual approach to this. Um, but we wanted to start with maybe we'll define um, some of the different places that massage therapists typically work in and um, what those kind of mean based on like compensation structures and stuff. So um, I know Nicole has a really good list, so I might kick that over to her. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I think we kind of were just uh, free talking between ourselves and what we wanted to sort of like rant about for a podcast and kind of like uh, the topic of like where RMTs are working, why they're working there. And we have both kind of worked at a few different types of places and we have lots of RMT colleagues who have worked at a bunch of different places. So I think we kind of just wanted to compare them all, give them our take on them and where we would work, where we maybe naturally would never work, if that's even a thing and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, so yeah, like, I kind of, go ahead. <laughs> it's definitely worth saying these are just from our experiences. This is just <laughs> our experiences alone, antidotal, take what you want from it. Um, and we'll, yeah, go from there. So absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if like there's any RMTs listening that work in maybe like a pretty unique scenario um, or unique place, um, we totally like to hear about that because I think uh, massage therapy as a profession is progressing and sort of slowly moving into different places that maybe we're not even sort of like aware of. So that would be awesome. <laughs> yeah, right? From you. Yeah. So the sort of places where I kind of came up where like a lot of RMTs are sort of starting to fall um, these days are in the in the big spas, um, in the chain massage clinics, um, sort of like massage attic, hand in stone, those types of places. Um, a lot of multidisciplinary clinics, um, a lot of clinics with multiple RMT. So it's a massage therapy clinic with just like a lot of um, different RMTs working there. Um, a lot of RMTs are working from home. Um, massage therapists are starting uh, to have their own office like you and I. Uh, that's sort of like where we're at. Um, mobile massage, I know it's big. Um, it's something I've done too. Um, then there's some office sharing, which we do, which is like our clinic, but I also know some RMTs that office share with just like a naturopath. So they're in an office, it's, it's a clinic, but it's just sort of like more than one healthcare practitioner, but they sort of share the office, but it's not like a big clinic. So it's like idea. one or two treatment rooms and they split it up. So like for us, we have one treatment room and we just split up the week between us, or you could have two treatment rooms and you have two practitioners, or you could throw a third one in the mix and yep. all do off hours from each other. Absolutely. Yeah. So there's lots of options out there, which is like really fantastic. Um, and then I mobile, love it. mobile massage is another one that's really popping up lately. Um, well, I shouldn't say lately. It's always been around out there, but I've seen a lot more being marketed on Instagram and everything of just strictly um, – mobile and mm -hmm. driving to your house to your house as a client and I think a lot of the clientele um, with that typically are older clientele um, who have mobility issues anybody who in general has mobility issues as well as recent moms or moms to small children who maybe it's hard to come into a clinic and you or find a sitter or anything like that so another really unique one I want to throw out there with them um, the mobile massage is usually that's by car. Uh, but my cousins live up in Georgian Bay and they know somebody up there who does mobile massage and it's by boat. So they'll drive over by boat to the cottages and they'll do massage that way. They typically charge a bit of a premium. I yes. don't know, their, but I know it's quite more than what you would find in the city. <laughs> yeah. Um, and typically they want to treat that they're going to boat to somebody's house. They want to treat at least two people. And it, it's usually a minimum of an hour and a half 
hour massage oh, each yeah. person. So, you know, you're going there for three plus hours. So yeah, yeah. that's very cool. Actually. Yeah. That sounds totally awesome. Fun. Like yeah. in cottage country, nah, I'd get on mm-hmm. that actually. <laughs> Yeah. Anybody need me to come to their cottage? (laughs) Yeah. And another one with that is I I think I went to school. I don't know if he's still treating, but um, he kind of like during the week held um, clinic hours in the city and then on weekends and then mostly in the summer that he had kind of like a clinic or home office at his cottage. So then he kind of had two groups of population of uh, clientele he was pulling from too that's so, awesome seasonal which is really, that's really yeah. cool <laughs> it's really seasonal cool, clientele yeah. oh yeah. that's very cool yeah, yeah. so that's awesome there's, yeah. there's so many different ways that a massage therapist can treat in especially in Ontario as well as across Canada and and the world for sure mm-hmm. uh, yeah yeah a lot it's of people, really neat um, with the home one, like you're saying, they usually have uh, a room in their house if it's a spare room or an office. But I also did see somebody, uh, I follow them on Instagram in Nottingham, England, and they have like a, one of those like uh, tiny houses in their backyard. Oh. Yeah. And that's their clinic. Like, so then people aren't even coming into their house. It's like completely separate and they have like their own two piece bathroom in there and everything they need. So it's, it's, I love that idea. I was like, if I that's had property, awesome. that's how I would do it because it's kind of like me mode and then work mode. Like you can yeah. still separate it, but like mm-hmm. it, I'm literally just walking out my back door. Yeah, on that, um, I actually know a massage therapist and um, her and her husband um, bought some property and they, it has like a nice big um, house and they're actually building their husband's uh, like dream garage and then on the top of this ginormous dream garage, she's building her like amazing massage therapy clinic like over top of it so it's like totally separated and they're like doing all the insulation and ceiling, you don't hear anything and all of that but I'm like that is amazing. Like that's yeah. like the best thing ever. <laughs> that sounds I, fantastic. <laughs> that's like my dream for sure. I would hold yeah. like, I would like to still hold like uh, office hours in the city, but then like eventually we want property. And if that happens, then yeah, I, like he, anything we look at needs the garage for him. So I'm like, <laughs> it needs like the garage office space for, for, for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So where, you know, yeah, so he can go work and you can go work too at the same time. Yeah. yeah. It's, um, it's worth noting that like when I first started as a massage therapist, to be honest with you, as much as there was like places you could go work, it felt very much like the only places to work were multidisciplinary clinics. Yeah. Um, there was the odd massage clinic here and there, like, um, and the odd massage therapists worked from their home. But it seemed like if you were getting into the business, and maybe it was just something I felt right from school, um, it felt like if you wanted to get in and you wanted to like work, it was you go to a multidisciplinary clinic, you work with a chiropractor and a physio and that kind of thing. And that's like where you sort of headed. Um, so I can honestly say like over the last like 10 11 ish years. Uh, it's really awesome, like seeing how many different sort of options we have. And I know we, I've mentioned before in other podcasts, like I never thought I'd be out of my own, having my mm-hmm. own clinic space. I always thought I'd be in a clinic. And there's lots of reasons for that. Like I loved it. Um, but uh, one other thing that wasn't really big when I first started it was the massage, th- like massage chain. So, mm-hmm. like Hand and Stone Massage Attic not a thing. Um, if it was like where I lived when I first started out in Northern BC, it was definitely not a thing. Um, that wasn't an option at all. Uh, And then even coming back to Ontario, it wasn't really, wasn't that big. So if it was, I think the way I sort of laid it, my career would be, would be different. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I would have started out in a multidisciplinary clinic, um, solely. I think Mm -hmm. I probably would have sort of like ventured off into a few different places as opposed to being in like a few different multidisciplinary clinics and always having my own thing. Um, uh, so yeah, it's kind of, it's interesting mm-hmm. what's out there now. And it sort yeah. of feels like, oh, even though I'm 10 years in, I still have like all this plethora of opportunity for me to be able to like take my career in whatever direction sort of works with my life and my family and stuff like yeah. that. So and it's as exciting. Your family, yeah. As your family changes, grows, you move, whatever it is, um, what a, it can like your career can grow and, and adapt to that as well that's what I, I think that's what really brought me back like one of the reasons mm-hmm. that brought me back too is I really really just liked that idea absolutely before we go any further let's kind of uh 
define out there just so that we can be clear with anyone listening out there kind of the different pay scales because um we kind of mentioned having an rmt clinic and then we kind of mentioned what we do in office share and they're different so um i would say the biggest difference is because of the compensation or the the pay with that so um there's a few different ways that rmts can kind of fall you can be um an employee earn a salary. Sometimes the salary, uh, especially at a spa, might be a base rate. And then if you perform a specific treatment, RMT treatment, you might get a, a bonus on top of that. That's that's kind of what I've he- I hear. That might not be every spa, but um, so you can be a, an employee completely as an RMT. Get um, EI, your mat leave. Uh, they might pay into a pension. All of that. Um, the biggest one I would say uh, next compensation model uh, would be a split is what we call it. And I'm sure there's other um, careers out there that call it that as well. So typically for a massage therapist, you're looking at either a 60, 40 or a 730 split. So 60% of the fee that you pay to um, the clinic as a client goes to the, the therapist um, and 40% would stay in the, cl- in the clinic and same goes with the 70, 30. Typically those are paid out from my experience. They were paid out either like every two weeks or once a month that you would kind of, what I would do is invoice the clinic and mm-hmm. they would then pay me. Um, so you're kind of seen in that light or should be seen in that light as a <laughs> subcontractor. Sometimes the lines do get blurred and um, you're, your contract says you're a self contract or self employed or self employed subcontractor, mm-hmm. but um, really by the law um, and the uh, employment regulations, there's some stuff in that contract that may make you an employee. technically employee. Yes. So um, I don't have a lot of experience on that, but I, I've ha- heard um, some things that some key points here and there, but. Um, Yeah. So just be uh, cautious of that. And then the other, I'd say most popular model, I don't know any other model other than the three of these would be a rent. um, And where you just play a straight rent to the owner of the building, the other renter of the building, whoever it is. um, And both the, um, and the, sorry, I should go back to the split. Sometimes, sometimes, most of the time at least should have a min max, at least a max for the month. So you're on a 60, 40 up until a thousand dollars a month, whatever it is. Um, ideally. <laughs> yeah, ideally. Um, yeah. So just to, um, maybe it's a bit early to throw out some figures, but I just wanted to throw these out there because I like to crunch my numbers. So just as a scenario to think through with all of these as we go in deeper into our experiences and whatnot. Um, a typical 70-30, I'm really talking to all the RMTs listening out there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's base this scenario off $100 per treatment, like $100 an hour. That does not include HST. We're just not even going to talk about HST in this. And let's say you're a therapist that works 20 hours a week, let's say four days a week, five hours hands-on or five one-hour clients. So when you bring that out, that's 17 days out of the month. That's 85 85 hours out of the month. So you're grossing off that $100 an hour, $8,500 a month. So if you were working a 70-30 split, no cap at a clinic, wherever, uh, you would be taking home per month $5,950 or $71 plus $1,000 a year, but you'd be giving the clinic $2,550 a month. And when you multiply that by 12 months, that's $30,000 a year. That is a lot. <laughs> that's a big number. That's probably somebody's entire salary. That could be possibly a receptionist. A yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you can imagine if you did that off a of 60-40, um, the numbers are uh, greater on the clinic's behalf. Um, yes. So I just wanted to like throw that out there again for RMTs. A lot of them may already have this in their head, but some might not have extrapolated it out to the year and how much they'd be paying off the mm-hmm. bat, especially mm-hmm. if they're new and just getting into this. But um, also some of our non-RMT listeners might think that 
take a look at that and think, whoa. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Happened. 70% is great. And it's like, yeah. it is until you realize you've paid a clinic $30,000. Um, I mean, yep. depends on what you're getting. There's a lot of factors yeah. and I'm sure we'll touch on all of those things. Mm-hmm. Um, no two contracts um, at clinics are the same. Uh, you really do have to look at a lot of factors like what you're getting, um, what you're not getting, how much you're putting into it, all of those types of things. Like, are you in a clinic? Are you working there part-time? Are you sharing a, that clinic room and you're still paying them $25,000? Yeah. Um, you know what I mean? So there's a lot of, um, a lot of different factors into like why maybe say giving a clinic um, 30% is valid and not having a maximum or giving the clinic 30% is absurd and you should really figure out um, what what you're worth in that sort of scenario, right? Um, I'm sure at some point it will sort of come across like both of our views. The reason we're out on our own is because we've done the whole big clinic thing and it just didn't really, it ended up not working for us for one way or another. Um, and it's not always necessarily like about the money, I think the figure at the end of the day, Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, hopefully the slant of like the reason we've gone to be out on our own and being our own bosses doesn't cloud the (laughs) judgment of like all of this. Um, because I, like, I was perfectly happy working in a clinic and there was nothing wrong with it. Um, but, uh, sometimes the universe pushes you in a way that's like, oh, well, maybe this is a better option for you. Yeah. So you take that. Uh, but yeah, with that, that we have a bias, but like we do, but we're trying not to like, let we're it not cloud. trying not to let it cloud. <laughs> um, I think a lot, a lot of this is we just, I wish I had have had um, mm-hmm. an RMT colleague, someone sort of break it down for me and be like, here are your options. Just because you choose one option doesn't mean you can't choose another one later on. Um, and don't, um, uh, like, don't feel bad about speaking up for yourself and your worth and what you're wanting, um, mm-hmm. whether you're in a clinic or not. And just c- say if you want something different, if you if you can't find it, that doesn't mean it won't happen. Like, you just sometimes need to wait it out in sort of like a time frame, right? Sometimes uh, what you're looking yeah. for comes to you, and sometimes you have to kind of go looking for it for a while. So, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I really wish I had had someone be able to tell me that. Um, but again, when I went out, it didn't seem like there were a whole ton of options. Yeah. Um, and there definitely wasn't where I went to go first work in BC. Uh, It really was, uh, you work on your own or you work in a clinic. And because I literally knew no one and knew nothing (laughs) in like a brand new province, the idea and lived in like an apartment, the idea of like opening up my own thing was absolutely not like an option, not financially, not like Mm -hmm. business brain wise. I had, I had nothing. So working for someone and I was actually an employee, which was strange, um, uh was like the best case scenario for me there I mean being an employee at a clinic sounds fantastic to me even now <laughs> even though I love being my own <laughs> boss it's um it's like oh yeah. that wouldn't be horrible those are sometimes I think hard to come by a lot of our a lot of places are um, percentage split with a minimum max or just a percentage split without that most of us are independent contractors so uh, that's probably what we're talking most sort of about so why don't we talk about um you like why did you choose um sort of like when you first started out uh working at a clinic versus on your own and then why after coming back did you really choose that you felt like working for yourself and only you was like the better bet so um all right so we'll start back we kind of went over like our a little bit of our background of where we worked and stuff so the first clinic I worked at was an RMT clinic she had had other RMTs in there before but when I was there I was the only other RMT and it was she also had um a psychotherapist um in there as well uh, but I never worked on the same days as her. But that wasn't the first interview mm-hmm. I had, which is interesting. I had an interview. My very first interview was at a chiropractor clinic, I, and they had RMTs on staff. And I was like a week out of getting my um, my registration. So oh, wow. so new. <laughs> something like that and um or I might not even have I might have got the letter that I passed but my registration hadn't come in the nail but I'd started the the interview processes Hmm. and I'm I don't remember what they offered I know it was a split I don't remember if there was a cap I don't think so I think it was a 60 40 and they offered me 
they were going to supply everything. I just had to show up with my lotion and if I had any other specific tools that I like to use. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think there was laundry on site. Um, I'm pretty sure all of that. And um, the question I remember most that sticks out in my head was they asked me, well, how many clients do you want to see in a day? And I remember mm -hmm. in school, they prepped us like, you're going to get asked this, like, just pick a number and like, stick to it. So I said six, five yeah. or six, because I always said that that was kind of like, you know, the industry standard or average. I said five to six and they were like, oh, really? Well, our other RMT, they do eight. Oh, my God. <laughs> and it <laughs> And I, so then as a new person, you're in an interview thinking like, I need to impress them. I'm like, well, maybe like I could work up to that. <laughs> um, and I just remember that that stuck out in my head that they didn't like, and they tried to manipulate, uh, this is just my, my feeling on it, that they tried to manipulate me into, because I was new to saying, oh, okay, like I'll do eight, but like I can tell you right now that I'm come home after six one hour clients in a day, even like if one of those is a 45 minute two, but six hours of hands on, I come home, I literally eat dinner and go to sleep. I'm, I can't, I'm done. Yep. So me doing like eight hours of hands on would not be possible. And I'm, further into it now <laughs> than yeah. I was then. so anyways I just remember I you know I think they offered me a position and I just said thanks but no thanks uh I had gotten this other opportunity at this other clinic um I had told the other therapist the one that I ended up going with um I'm pretty sure I told her I had this interview and I I'm just going to I believe her intention was pure and her motivation was pure but she kind of knew of the reputation of this clinic and was just like, be careful, tread lightly. Um, they tend to overwork their therapists. So mm -hmm. um, some people might say she was trying to, you know, get me to work with her, but I truly, truly in my heart of hearts believe that um, her intentions were pure in that and was just looking out for me. Um, so anyways, the clinic I started with, I was on a 70-30 split, which had a, only a cap. There was no minimum. Um, and the cap was per month, depending on how many days out of the week you worked. Oh, okay. Um, mo and that those days were based on a five client, six hour hands on six hour okay. day. Yeah. Um, so, um, but I'll say the minimum was, uh, I believe a cap of $1,200. Okay. And, and everything was there too. Yeah. I just literally had to walk in with oils. Like everything I needed was there. Laundry was on site. So I'd say that was pretty good. Yeah. Like, especially to start out like that was, I don't think she, I think she just wanted to have other therapists there. I don't think her goal was, I need to make money off this person. Um, it was a three room clinic. It was really large clinic. So I think that was really great. Um, I learned a lot again from her. I said that before she also taught me my cupping and everything like that. Um, I think it was just, I would have, I probably would have stayed there. We had some issues like with the building. There yeah. was a, there was a flood and things like that. So um, that's when I ended up moving um, in with my dad and the commute turned into an hour commute and it just it it wasn't working my heart wasn't there anymore and it had nothing to do with anything of the clinic it just yeah. my heart wasn't there anymore because of the commute I didn't like the commute so so that's kind of like where I started but I feel like um I like you had said I felt like there was no way I could do this on my own first out like I I had to be in a clinic whether I actually had to or not I just felt like I had to for the sense of I still need to learn a whole lot. Um, I kind of felt like I needed a mentor. Yeah. But, and to see business, to see how it runs and all of this. Um, but I also felt like I needed to be from like the industry as well. Not yes. just my own feelings, but like, oh, you're young. You need, you need to work in a clinic. There's no way you're going to be able to do it on your own. So it was just like, yeah, you're probably right. So, and I'm kind of <laughs> feeling that way. So I'm just going to go into a clinic. So I, 
I enjoyed, really enjoyed my experience there and it was a beautiful clinic. It really was. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's kind of like where I started. Uh, what about you? Where did you start? How'd you, uh, how'd I start? Well, my options were super limited. Uh, when I first went out, I did a few interviews. So uh, when I first got to BC and I got my, um, registration, I literally went on Google and Googled like massage therapy for St. John. <laughs> Like I had no idea like where there was any massage, if there was like massage in this mm -hmm. city I was in. So I started there. Um, I actually had an interview with um, a chiropractor and it was really funny because it kind of baffled me because I contacted them. I was like, hi, my name's Nicole. I'm brand new to the area. I'm from Ontario. I'm a registered massage therapist here now in BC. I'm looking for a place to work. Do you have anything? He's like, yeah, come, for, like, come over. We'll chat. He actually didn't even have anything for me um he just wow. straight up wanted to like meet me and like maybe see if sometime down the rat like road I'd want to work for him and I was like okay so it was an interesting introduction because he had all these questions for me I had absolutely no um answers to I just remember sitting there and being like I don't know because he's like oh what would you want to be paid I'm like I don't know and it's like how many hours <laughs> do you want to work absolutely no idea um like what kind of clientele you want it's like I, I don't know like I know I've been registered for five minutes like I actually have no idea <laughs> what I'm doing um so after that I remember being like I think I need I think I need like an established clinic that maybe has an RMT or two that I can really draw some experience from um and on top of that when I was in school I got some really great um at least I felt it was really great sort of um insight and sort of like um just something to think about like as a new uh, therapist starting out in sort of any industry, I guess it could go across as um, the, the teacher had told us um, when you're looking for a place, think about where you're at in terms of like your actual trade. So you as a massage therapist, our trade, because when you come out of school, you're definitely still pretty green. You know what I mean? Like you put your hands on a lot of people, but you still have a lot to learn. Mm -hmm. So they were like, instead of going out, if you, if you can, you're comfortable, instead of going out and just full out being like learning all the business and all the hands on and all of it at once, sort of hone your craft first, let someone else take um, reins of like payroll, take reins of like leaky roofs, like all of those things. Mm -hmm. um, and sort of just learn what your hands are doing and build those confident, um, like the, the confidence in that. Um, and there, if after that, something I learned in working in clinics is successful people love to share how they were to become successful. Um, I've never worked at a clinic and not sort of asked that question and been like, how did you get here? Right. Um, so in that, um, I really learned a ton from everywhere I worked. Um, and that's sort of how I ended up out on my own. But starting out, like I found um, a multidisciplinary clinic, clinic that had a naturopath, actually two, but that one naturopath was also a chiropractor. And then I had one full time massage therapist and she was crazy busy. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually got brought on because she was going away to India to learn yoga. So they needed someone. Also, she was like maxed out full busy. So they wanted to bring on someone else sort of take on some extra people. So that was really good. Um, I got thrown right into it. Uh, the I was an employee there. But how it sort of worked and when you touch on sort of um, earlier with the when you're in a contract and you should, you're an employee, like you're an independent contractor, but you should be an employee. Um, it's interesting how this one works. So I was actually an employee. So I got paid. Um, I didn't get paid an hourly wage though. <laughs> it wasn't oh, that. So I only okay. got paid. I was paid fee for service. Mm -hmm. It was um, a 70, 30 split. And they paid all of my HST. So I literally got, um, so it was 70, 30, uh, before HST. Mm -hmm. Um, so, or no, it started at 60, 40, I believe. Yeah. started at a 60, 40. Um, so I got 60% before HST. They remitted all the HST. I don't have to worry about any of that. So I was, I was an employee. So out of my paycheck, um, every two weeks came out EI, Canadian pension plan, all of those types of thing, income tax and stuff like that. Um, but it wasn't, um, any like set 
amount of hours. Like I wasn't like salaried or like whatever. Um, And there was no like bonus for massaging. It's just like you got to work and make money that day. Uh, So it'd be like if you had a part-time job working at like McDonald's where you only get paid for the hours of the shift that you work, right? Mm -hmm. Um, But there was no minimum. Like it it wasn't like you always get three hours a week. Like there was nothing sort of like that. So Mm -hmm. it was good. I didn't have to worry about too much. Um, I did though, however... um, So this was like my first actual contract to negotiate. I did negotiate with him that when I hit a certain amount of um, revenue um, for two months straight, it went up to 65.35. And then when I hit a certain amount of revenue for two months straight, I got 70.30. So there was brackets. Um, Okay. So I don't exactly remember what the numbers were, but you can just say for argument's sake, um, I got uh, 60.40. If I made $1,000, then if for two consecutive months, I did $2,000 worth of revenue, then it went up permanently to $65.35. And then if I went up to $3,000 of revenue, it permanently went up to $70.30 type of idea. So I just had to hit those types of like sort of like minimums. Um, And I guess they felt that if you hit it for two months straight, then it was probably going to be a pretty consistent thing and you've sort of built that clientele high enough to sustain that sort of higher percentage I am assuming that sort of now that I know a little bit of business that's sort of where they went with it so that was interesting because that was not something at all that they'd ever talked about when I was in Mm -hmm. sort of school so that was kind of neat because I originally didn't want to do like a 60 40 split um right out of the gate I sort of felt like I was worth more than that um oddly enough (laughs) Mm -hmm. because I've taken a 60 40 split since then. Uh, so he sort of built that in. And because of that, when the other RMT came back from India, uh, he actually offered it to her too. Uh, mm-hmm. But because she was full time, she immediately jumped into like the highest bracket of whatever, which she was really happy about. Um, mm-hmm. Cause she was kind of not happy that they hired me. <laughs> so oh. I, I kind of helped her out. Um, we actually still are on like Facebook and stuff like that. Um, mm-hmm. So like, it's really funny. Uh, it was really good. Actually. I was pretty stoked about that. So, just to clarify, so you were on the 60-40 and then once you hit um, a revenue of a certain amount for two weeks or for two months straight, then you yes. would flip up to the next bracket and you would stay in that bracket? Yes, I would stay okay. there. So it wasn't like if you made it less and you bump it down. It was like you've, yeah. you've shown enough, um, I don't know, initiative or whatever that you now yeah. get just to make the next okay. amount. So that was really awesome. Um So what was hard was actually, so I was only there a year and um, because of how little RMTs were out there, by the seven month mark of me being out there, I had already hit the top bracket for two months straight and it's already in the 70-30. Oh, nice. so yeah, it was awesome. Um, so I remember though having a struggle with the clinic owner about me getting it because um, he didn't think I would hit it so soon. Obviously, uh, not, so I was not betting on that. <laughs> no, um, so I remember having to have a conversation with him, um, and being 22 and going into your boss, like he was. So he was the. So the wife was the chiropractor natural path, and then he was like the clinic manager. So they ran it together. It was like a family okay. business, so, but he took care of like all the, you know, making sure they had the lawn cut and the you know, payroll and all of that kind of thing. So he was more of the business mind. He wasn't a clinician in any way. No, he wasn't. So um, I remember having to be like, I guess I got to go talk to him, right? So um, I remember going in there and I remember him giving me a bit of a hard time about it. And I'm like, well, this is what we agreed to. This is what we signed and me kind of getting the run around. So I actually went and talked to his wife because she's still a business owner, although she didn't really do a lot of business. I remember going to her and just being like, a practitioner to a practitioner, like this is super sucky, right? Like I'm 22 and I know I don't have anything, right? And I know you've built this business from the ground up, but like I came in here in good faith, signed a contract. And I think that that contract should be upheld, right? Mm. Um, And I remember her being like, I agree. I don't think I'd want to work anywhere that didn't pay me what they said they would. So um, right like that, by the you know what I mean like it was all sorted out he never came to me and talked to me after being like oh you talked to my wife they clearly went home and had a discussion about it that I was I wasn't say, part what, of hmm, what kind of <laughs> argument happened at home that night <laughs> um but nonetheless uh it was it was good um and it went really well um I really enjoyed working there the only reason I left is because I moved home um I did while I was out there though after being there probably 
and working t two or three months, I did start my own sort of like ho home, we'll call it home, home slash mobile practice. So I would go to, um, and I started advertising it. So I would go to people's houses. I would bring my table, set it up do that really classic mobile, um, but also was treating out of my spare bedroom in my apartment building, <laughs> which I don't really know if I was able to or allowed to, but that's what I did. It was all set up like a clinic. It was all like the right standards you needed, that kind of thing. Um, uh, but yeah, so I started doing like mobile slash like home treatments. And I've always like from then, always, always, always had my own side thing. And I'll say this, the reason I did that is because a lot of time with contracts, you get into these like non-competes situations. And um, I realized that if I sort of went into an interview and they asked, do you work anywhere else? And I said, if I said, I sort of built this clientele that does mobile and home, there's not a whole lot they can say about it. If they don't like it, then you, you don't work there kind of idea. Um, so I always always had that in my back pocket. I also always felt that it was good to have something that you could sort of work on on your own um, mm -hmm. and have other avenues. If anything were to happen, you didn't have all your eggs sort of in like one basket. Mm -hmm. um, Cause you never know, you work for a clinic, you don't know what they're doing with their money, it folds and now you're out of work, right? So I always sort of felt like I needed to have that. So I've always since, like month two of being RMT done like mobile stuff. And I still do. So although I work at our clinic, um, I still do house calls. Mm -hmm. um, I don't do any out of my personal home because I have a toddler. So that's like mm -hmm. not even an option. Um, but yes, <laughs> I always, yeah. uh, I always do um, have had house call sort of stuff like that. So that's sort of where I started. And then when I redid it all again, when I came back to Ontario, mm -hmm. uh, I went straight to working at a chiropractor clinic for a chiro that I personally knew. Um, in a very well established chiropractic clinic. Um, so, uh, and then I did my own stuff because I had family um, and friends, which is a whole different discussion on do yeah. we treat family and friends? Uh, <laughs> yeah. But uh, I did um, a clinic there um, in Uxbridge, which is about 40 minutes from where I currently live. And then after about three months, I realized the 40 minute commute was too much, plus. It was a very small town. So I started working in Oshawa at a clinic, at a chiropractic clinic. So there's two chiros and they had had an RMT, but she had left. So then I came on and kind of took her spot. So I was sort of, I sort of walked into a clientele there. Um, so in Oshawa, I was doing a 60, 40 split, no men, no max. Um, and then in Uxbridge, I was doing a 70, 30 split with a $400 minimum and a uh, $1,200 maximum, okay. which felt really fair for how many hours per week I was sort of working there. Um, so and it was you, actually, sorry, sorry I was going to say, it, would you say then that a $1,200 roughly in that, or let's say a thousand to 1500 in our area um, is a kind of a standard cap? Yeah, I think yeah. so. Um, at that clinic, though, so you got like a bunch of things. I did $1,200 max and I did everything myself. I got reception who booked my appointments and took the money and wrote it all down and uh, they printed receipts and stuff like that. But I did every everything else. Mm -hmm. um, I had the table. I brought uh, the linens. I did the laundry at home, my um, lotion, like all those types of things. Um, and then the 60-40 at the clinic with no min, no max was they had a laundry service. Um, they did all the booking. They handled all the money. I, they also would do all the lotion and stuff like that. Um, and, the, um, and then, so I was only, I only had to show up. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's interesting how much it varies. Oh, and at the yeah. clinic in BC, they gave me everything. I literally did. I just showed up okay. um, to like whatever I didn't have. They had laundry on site. So we had to like rotate it and stuff, but I didn't have mm -hmm. to do anything. So when you showed up uh, for the for each of those, you just showing up, you said, or they and they're booking on your behalf. Mm -hmm. um, did you ever know before you went in the day before, like how many clients you had the next day? Like, did you ever get like a call or an email or some sort of, this is what your day looks like the next day? Or it was just, you just showed up and, oh, my day, this is what it is. And this is, you know, I'm showing up at nine, but my first not client's not till 1230. Okay, cool. Like. Um, in the beginning, it was that way. So when I was at West, in the beginning, it was that way. And then I started really not liking the fact that I was showing up and sitting around for 
absolutely nothing because no one's paying me an hourly wage. And I was an employee, but I wasn't getting an hourly wage. So I didn't feel I should be there. Um, so I started doing that at the end of the day because their clinic only was only open. If you can imagine, it was only open nine to five. That was their clinic oh, hours, wow. which is ri- insane, right? Yeah. I had to actually ask them to stay till six o'clock. <laughs> And they're like, well, you're going to be by yourself. Like it was, it was wild. Oh my God. Um, so, uh, I would call it around like quarter to five kind of idea. I would call the clinic if I wasn't already there till five, if I wasn't there. And, um, I would just ask them, I would just, uh, like call and ask like, Hey, like what time do I start tomorrow? And what does my day kind of look like? Um, mm. cause nobody answered the phones after five o'clock anyways, until 9am the next day. So I knew it wasn't going to change until 9am. Um, uh, mm. but if I was at the clinic, I would just take a gander. So it wasn't too bad. Um, but it was kind of like a free for all, but I realized really shortly that like really quickly that showing up when you're have no one, nothing to do is kind of like a waste. It just felt like a waste of time. <laughs> well, especially if you're, if you're under a clinic that's potentially doing your, mar- like all your marketing and doing all mm-hmm. of that, like you literally are just going in there and, and okay, maybe catching up on some of your own documentation and paperwork, or maybe read an article for your, like, you know, your, your quality assurance or, you know, things like that. Yeah. But like, you could also do that from the comfort of your home. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, that's definitely it. So yeah. And then the clinics were not like when I came back to Ontario, um, basically like, well, in Uxbridge, they would give me a call because I sort of off days. So I like alternate. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I was in Oshawa, Tuesday, Thursday, I was in Uxbridge kind of thing. And then I had one Saturday here, one Saturday there and that kind of stuff. So, um, I just asked them, um, that if I didn't start at nine to give me a call. So if I didn't hear anything, I essentially knew I was starting at nine and I just showed up then. Um, and then how the rest of the day fell out, as we know, even now, like you never know, like you could walk in and being like, this is my day today. And by like 11 a.m., it looks nothing like it did. Yeah. Uh, so so um, uh, I just sort of had a standing in with them with that because I wasn't like there e- each clinic every day um, that if I didn't start at nine, then to uh, give me a call and let me know when. Mm-hmm. Um Yeah, in that, I'll say that I did find that um, the clinic that I worked at in Oshawa, um, that's when I really noticed the whole, like, you're an independent contractor, but you feel like an employee sort of scenario where they'd be like, oh, no, you don't start till 11. So, you know, I'd be like, sweet, I'm going to the gym. And Mm -hmm. at like 945, they give you a call and be like, can you be here for 10? We have someone who just had a chiro appointment and they like really want a massage. And they knew I was only like a 10 minute drive away. Mm -hmm. And it was really hard to have those boundaries be like, nope, I'm sweaty at the gym. I have another 25 minutes of cardio to do and I'm not leaving. Mm -hmm. Um, And they'd get really upset. And I remember being like, well, like, you know what I mean? Like, especially uh, as a new therapist, like you're yeah. kind of, you really feel like, oh, I shouldn't be a turning this down, down. be yeah. like, uh, okay, now I could potentially lose that client. They may never book with me again. Mm-hmm. See the clinic, like it might cause like issues in the clinic. So you really feel that pressure to not set a boundary as, as a new therapist. Absolutely. Sure. Yeah. You feel like you definitely can't have any boundaries and you can't have any say in how like your day looks like if you already have six hours and you're like, this is going to be enough. Um, and they're like, can we squeeze another in there? Like, are you feeling it? You know what I mean? And you're just like, no, definitely not. Like, I know I'm already done at six and usually I work till seven, but I've already done my six hands on hours. Like I'm out. Right. So those boundaries um, really early on in my career, I, ha- I started having to set them um, and it really sort of set me up for like the rest of the years to follow. And oddly enough, the further into my career I got, the more I found clinics and um, clinic owners trying to push those boundaries, like it seemed like the industry started started to change Um, because RMTs were starting to work longer in their careers. And early on, it was like, oh, you do 10 years and you're burnt out and you're done. Right. Uh, So I started finding that a lot of clinics just started being like, oh, you don't want to do eight hours. And it's like, no, or, oh, you don't need like, do you really need 15 minute break between every single client? Right. Because if you if you times that by five people, you could put in a whole nother hour. And it's just like, yeah, I would like to have a sandwich or take a drink or pee or like something or switch over the laundry that I have to do or do a file, like that kind of thing. So uh, I think a lot of RMTs run into that, like boundaries. Um, And that's sort of like a basis for like what pushed me into like 
ever really thinking I needed to be out on my own. So it was simply that it was, it was, it wasn't really even money. It was boundaries. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I find with that first clinic I was in, um, we definitely the f- had 15 minutes and she was like, you 15 minutes, you need to take that 15 minutes. But I do, that is one thing when you say where you kind of, where you're blurring the line between independent contractor and employee, even though the contract clearly laid out um, that I was independent contractor, there was this like this expectation. We didn't have front desk. So we were in charge of our front desk. Um, and some of that we were, I should say, we were kind of like in a little like, strip mall or whatever you want to call it um so we were like people could be walking in we were Mm -hmm. you know open glass windows very accessible to the public ground level and so we would get just people walking in and asking questions which is great however it what I found difficult was sometimes I'd be in treatment or we'd both be in treatment and you'd hear the bell of the door and we were kind of she did, and then I felt it was an expectation to poke your head out from the treatment. Oh, yeah. And greet that client, which really bothered me because I'm like, I'm taking away from that client. Also, now my hand, like, I'm going to have to technically, like, you know, I open the door, I'm going to have to go wash my hands again. So, I, honestly, a lot of the time, I would, like I do now, <laughs> use a towel to open a lot of doors. And that's probably because of the habit I got in there yeah. that I would use a towel so that I was still like sanitary. Um, but I just felt like it would interrupt the client. Then you're taking away from the client on the table. You're trying to hurry with the person at the door. Then they're asking questions and they may never, may never have had massage before. And you're kind of rushing them through it. So then they feel like they're an inconvenience. Well, I'm not going to come back here. So to me, it just didn't feel like it worked. Like I didn't yes. like that part. Um, I think when I was there, sometimes on my own, I would just lock the door while I was in treatment and put a sign that I would be back. Um, which I see a lot of clinics do that. If, if all the therapists are in treatment and they're a walk-in type clinic like that, um, they lock the door. And if you have an appointment and you're just early, you just sit in your car and wait for them to unlock it. That's fine. Um, but I did feel like that. And, and my other thing is I'm weird when it comes to the phone. Like I (laughs) like now that my clients actually come to my personal phone, call me there because I'm weird even though I spent so many years <laughs> as a front desk administrative person like and I've been answering yeah. phones for like even my high school job I worked at a pharmacy so I answered the phone yeah I just don't like doing that and I don't like <laughs> calling people back even though people are like you're so good at it I'm like I know I'm good at it but I don't like to do it so that was the other <laughs> thing I kind of didn't like yeah. to do sorry any of my clients out there like I I'm sorry I do call all of you back but I just don't because a lot of the time they're always like scammers or this or that and I'm like you're just wasting my time and yeah I like to screen calls yeah Yeah. I'm pretty sure all my clients now know like easiest way to get a hold of me is like a text or a Mm -hmm. Um, an email and if you have to call like it's definitely going to voicemail unless like you're already in my phone as a client and I know the name uh, that's how I screen every single yep. <laughs> I do, and I do and yeah. that was the other thing with the walk-ins like being on the ground floor like uh, the uh, walk-in yeah. business is good I get it I understand from a business and a marketing standpoint how good that is but I don't like it as a clinician no, I neither. there were so many times that I would be you know waiting for that last person or I had an hour break and it was the evening like I had somebody they ended around like quarter to six and then I didn't see my next client until seven so I really had that bit of a break but also mentally in that time I'm like okay I'm gonna chart I'm gonna eat something use the washroom do some laundry like I've already filled that time yes. in my head yes. and then somebody comes in and they just see you sitting there they know that you're the clinician and it's kind of like well why can't you take me right now well I don't know who you are I like you literally just walked in it's seven o'clock at night you know what I mean I'm in here by myself I didn't feel comfortable and I agree there's that cooling off period of like somebody might be just be oh this is a great idea but they maybe didn't you know if they thought about it or they thought we were a different type of clinic yes too I never came across that but I think that cooling off period between booking and your and your appointment is crucial Um, absolutely so I never really won for walk-ins. And I would say both the clinics that I worked at before what we have now had as part of their business model, a walk-in 
yeah was part of it and then it, that i i just it never was my cup of tea i yeah. i never liked it because i felt, didn't feel grounded i didn't feel prepared i felt like in those instances i wasn't as calm and collected doing intake and because i just felt scatterbrained so it just never was my cup of tea that's for sure Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, no, I feel the same way. Um, when I worked at clinics and we do the lock the door thing because mm-hmm. it's just one of us ever in the clinic at a time. So uh, you walk into the reception room and then right behind that is the treatment room. So um, right when I went in my own, I started locking the door and I started doing it because um, a lot of uh, just people in the buildings. We're actually on the second floor of the building. So it's not like a storefront. So you don't get that. Um, but uh people do just walk by um, because there are other businesses in our building that have clients come in and out. And I find, I found that I would um, just be sitting there and even with the door closed, people would come in. So I learned early on that I really need to shut and lock the door a for my safety, B for the safety of the client on the table and uh, C for like the safety of all like the things I have, like I had my Mm -hmm. laptop there and I had a cash box and my phone and my like payment terminal and all of that. My Um, purse. (laughs) Yeah. Cause I don't bring any of that in. Right. So into the treatment room, treatment treatment so uh i we we lock the door and we have a pretty little sign on the door that you made mm-hmm. that says yep. you know um opened if the door is locked please wait we'll be with you like shortly and on the other side it's like close and, like give us a call if you need us right kind of thing mm-hmm. so yeah i think there's um, no clinic hours right now so yeah, yeah exactly yeah. right so um uh, I find that works out pretty good. Um, mm-hmm. I don't think we've, I don't think we've lost any business because of it. Cause on the door, we also have like both our profiles, we have our hours, we have our contact information, we have business cards. So like, if it were to be a walk-in, those would be the things people are looking for. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, so I, th- I think, and it allows people to have that cooling off people it also allows people to go to like your website or my website and yeah. sort of like really see what they want. And I kind of, I kind of really like that about our model. <laughs> well, and I think in the last 10 years that has become such a pillar in business now is yes. people will vet you as a service, as a product by going to your website first. And I don't find, and maybe that's just because we're on the second floor and I don't experience as much, but even in general, I don't think there's as many walk-ins that are just like, oh, what is this kind of thing? <laughs> it's, it, they've already kind of vetted that, that business and they're just going to get more information. Like that's what I did when we adopted our dog and I, all the vets, I, yes went online and wrote down, vetted them all. And then I went to them and said, can you give me more information? So I think that's kind of more of the mentality people take now. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah, Google's great for that. People can leave the reviews and stuff. So uh, people can really look to see if it's like what they are Mm -hmm. looking for. So that's really helped. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 10 years ago, that wasn't really a thing. So yeah, no, that was good. I mean, um, do you still do, like, do you do mobile stuff at all or still not not really really. no I'm not really well especially not right now but I'm not (laughs) really uh, I do um the odd for uh certain a lot usually it's moms (laughs) that are either pregnant or just had baby or whatnot um but I don't really I did a little bit in the past um kind of like a a a parent's friend's parent who is immobile and in pain bedridden and I've done uh, a little bit of that here and there I did do a home visit with a um uh MS no an ALS patient oh yeah I did some home care for them for a while that might be a whole other um topic because I would do home care, um, just some general stuff, a, some really joint, low grade joint mobs, things like that, more movement. Um, but I did have a traumatizing experience and I'll uh, save that for another, um, <laughs> was traumatizing for me and not traumatizing for her, but that just goes to show that like as somebody able-bodied and not dealing with a a disease like that um how much we take for granted um Mm -hmm. in this life for the fact that we went through it and she was like yeah okay that's my everyday life but for me like I still sometimes feel like I feel the effects of it to this day like oh wow yeah so um so I think maybe that experience also brought me from not really wanting to do home there was just so much liability and risk sometimes that I didn't yeah. want to take on. But um, interesting enough that I had met that client through 
a clinic that I had interviewed for in between the one clinic, the first clinic and the next clinic, I was going to, um, the one therapist put me in touch with this chiropractor in the area and I interviewed with him. Didn't really quite like the room set up. Um, it was also like in one of an older home type thing and it was like mm-hmm. a lot of stairs up. So my thought was to the accessibility factor of for some clients. Um, but also I don't remember what he offered. I know it was a split. I can't remember if it was a cap. I believe it was probably like a 60, 40 or even a 65, 35 type um, but I would be supplying majority of everything, doing my own laundry. Um, but there had been front desk, they would have taken payment. They would have done the HST, all of that. But the reason I didn't go with it was he really wanted you to buy into his healthcare system. Oh, I have a similar story. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and I even, he was like, come to a seminar. I hold these seminars weekly for my clients, come check it out, bring people. And so I actually brought my friend and my dad, just because I was like, I feel like I need another opinion. And we both walked out of there and they're both so kind, (laughs) my friend and my dad. And they were like, yeah, well, that's not like interesting. And I just was like, what? And they're like, "Mm, no, 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 yeah, (laughs) no seems too like sales pitchy and uh, and like too much of like you follow this and if you step out of that like cookie cutter recipe like you're not going to fit in there and they're like yeah. and you're not that kind of person and I'm like okay perfect I'm glad I brought you guys along so I think it was in the 11th hour with him unfortunately I was just like you know what this doesn't feel like it jives with me at all and I'm I'm just going to take a different avenue which then led me to the the second clinic I worked in which was um, multidisciplinary chiropractor other massage therapists, chiropodists, and a naturopath as well. So nice. pretty pretty big clinic, pretty established yeah. in the yeah. town it was in. Um, that was a split with a cap. They did the split before the HST. Um, the one thing with him, though, I don't – I was trying to before we started podcasting here. Yeah. I was trying to find the contract. I have it somewhere. I can't remember what it was. Again, I think it might have been a 65-35 or a 70-30 can't remember what the cap was the hst i remitted so he would give it to me separately outside of the split but then i would when i invoiced him i would have to deduct he would tell me how much per month the processing payment processing fee was and i would have to deduct that as well so that i paid that to him separately so to me that was pretty messy and yes considering now that i see what payment processing for an RMT is yeah. for an RMT is like it's pretty minimal. minimal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I just felt like it overcomplicated when you're already getting thirty or forty percent of my pay. You really couldn't take out between ten yeah. and thirty dollars max um, for that. So and considering him another rmt and the chiropodist were all in that payment system the naturopath had their own payment processing the terminal oh yeah so, <laughs> um so yeah that was that and they had front desk staff i even actually uh, because i was just wanting more money but i couldn't take on more hours mm-hmm. as a massage therapist i was like i have no problem like working the front desk some nights and stuff and helping out because i think somebody was leaving so they were actually training me for that before i left but um yeah so that was i brought in everything too like i was given a room with a desk and i supplied everything else within it there there was no laundry on the side at the time but they were like working on it he showed me there was a closet with laundry in it just wasn't hooked up yet and they were working on it and never got um done before I left so um yeah so that was it was really good again learned a lot I was able to volunteer with some sports teams and uh dragon bro races um we set up a tent for that so we're really involved in the community which I really liked that part of it for sure um but again I f- even though I was probably a year and a half into it when I started, I still felt so green and like I did need to go the extra mile. So I did sign up. They needed an RMT for this music festival in the area. And I kind of felt pushed to do it because the other RMT didn't want to. But I felt like a fish out of water at this music festival. I just it 
I just didn't feel like I fit in no matter how much I tried. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I just, again, I don't think I would say yes to it now just because I don't think my personality would have fit into it and then it wouldn't have been authentic. It's not like I have judgment towards whatever the music festival is. It was just, I felt like I wouldn't have been as authentic as I should have been, which then would have meant that people to come see me weren't getting everything they could have out of my free little mini treatment. And then therefore they're not going to come to the clinic. So it just doesn't Mm -hmm. work. Um, Also, I was at that clinic. I'll say I did MBA and WSIB too at that clinic. Mm -hmm. And that was my first, um, first go around with that. And unfortunately I do not take those cases on now. It's also difficult for us to take them on and how we have our setup because we don't have a chiropractor or physio or anything. So, um, yeah. So again, I, there was always just something they were great. Had great, I said, great experience, met some great people. I think, I had very good experience with those clinics in the sense of my contract and everything. Yes. Um, You know, there may have been a couple little things here and there that I would fine tune now, but overall, I think their intent and their, where their hearts, both practitioners hearts laid was good and from a good place. Um, But always something was missing. There was just always something missing. And I think that was just that, I couldn't have full control of things. So I will say there, like at the second clinic, um, they had their own computer system to do all their bookings, but they didn't want to include me into that system. So I had to bring my own paper because at the time they weren't going to add on another system. Yeah for the front desk to use so I had to use a paper notebook and so I didn't like that because it was again yeah I felt like I had to call the night before to find out when my start time was but then I felt like it I was an inconvenience for doing that because why aren't you what do you mean you're not coming in at nine o'clock tomorrow morning what if somebody calls overnight and says that they can be here for nine o'clock we're gonna book them in um so I didn't really like that that bothers me a whole lot I like to have before I go to bed at night know what my day is potentially gonna look like yes. tomorrow yes it still could change but it doesn't um, mostly not that I, much I don't know if you found this but I found working in clinics it was wild how much it would change and mm-hmm. I can honestly say I could probably count on one t- hand in yeah. three years oh gosh this so May 1st will be three years since I got the oh, keys to this uh, clinic uh, wild right yeah so uh, it'll be like on one hand in three years, how many days have gone like completely not the way they look like you have the odd cancellation here and there mm-hmm. or odd no show, I guess here and there. But like, yeah. I, it was crazy when I worked in a clinic, like I would show up and it would be like completely crazy. And then working on my own, like it doesn't, it doesn't happen. Like even just cancellation wise, like I found like it always happened. You work at a clinic, mm-hmm. people cancel, turn around, all of that. Yeah. And at the clinic, I, even right from the beginning, even when I wasn't sort of jam packed full and people had to wait like a few weeks to get in and that kind of thing. Um, right from the beginning, I found like it wasn't like that. And, and my theory to that is that when you're working at a clinic, you do sort of get put under their umbrella, right? So mm-hmm. a lot of clients assume that you're an employee, right? Mm-hmm. So they assume when they call and cancel at the clinic, if you're just waiting around for now, you're, you're making money somehow. And most of us, 98% of us aren't. Mm-hmm. So um, it takes that piece out of it. Um, on top of that, so when you're working like us one-on-one, when clients call and they get me and they tell me they're canceling for no good reason, um, they know that they're taking from like a person who's not mm-hmm. making any money for an hour now. Now, I always have like a hundred million things to do. So um, mm-hmm. it's not a big deal and it really doesn't happen that often. So when people cancel, like it's not generally a big deal to me anymore but um, when working on a clinic I often would take like a Saturday of a long weekend shift and it drove me absolutely Mm. mad when I would show up for 9 a.m and that person's like sorry I slipped in because long weekend and on the Friday Mm. I like and then having to go to the clinic and be like we need to charge them but they're a good client client and they come in all the time and I'm like that's great they're now not a good client. <laughs> like yeah. I, I showed up for nothing. I could have filled it with 10 other names, but I mm-hmm. showed up at 8.30 and at 9.05, they, we called them and they said they weren't coming in. Um, and a lot of clinics don't want to charge like the fee because they're worried the person won't come back. And I mean, I've struggled with this from time mm-hmm. to time, but um, 
uh, when I went on my own, I really made that firm boundary that no client of mine will, um, that's good to me um, and worthy of my time and my skills and my treatment um, will, will sort of like run railroad me mm -hmm, sort of like mm -hmm. that. Um, so I kind of had that really hard boundary when I went out on my own and um, set that very firm pillar. I have people sign a cancellation policy. They understand it. I go over it with them when they come in. I say, you sign this. I just want to make sure you understand it. Now, like I understand life happens and mm -hmm. tires fall off and, and kids get sick and jobs make you stay for a meeting you didn't know about. Like I understand like you don't even have to be deathly ill to not come in and cancel yeah. last minute. Um, uh, but uh, know that if I feel it's starting to become a pattern and you're not respecting my time, like yeah. I will charge you. Um, yeah. And what I have noted is most clients that really do care about you and what you do for them, they offer to pay anyways. Yeah. Um, you know what I mean? So yeah. uh, that was something I always had an issue with every clinic I've ever worked at. That's a good uh, mention is that I've had my rare cancellations last minute um, in this last year have been fewer and far between than when I was in the clinic. I never put two and two together like that. Plus there was with the clients that I've had to say, no, you know what? I'm, I'm going to have to charge you within this last year on my own. Um, they kind of say it to me first, like, okay, how much do I owe you for this? You. Versus when I was at the clinic, it, it wasn't like that at all. But no. and I, I never realized that until you brought that. That's wild. It's so yeah. true. It's so yeah, it true. is. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that's what it is. So I remember like when I worked at a clinic, having a client, they kind of no showed a few times. And I was like, so I know you come like every month or, you know, twice a month, whatever, but you've no showed like three times in last whatever I have to charge you. I remember them looking at me shocked me being like, I don't get paid if you don't show up. I'm paid a percentage split. I make 60%, including the 13% HST. So of that 60%, 13% isn't even mine, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm making less than 50% of that treatment fee per hour. And then I have to pay income tax and blah, blah, blah. So if like you don't show up, I literally am sitting here doing nothing. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not getting paid. And it wasn't until I explained to them that I wasn't an employee that they were like, I'm so sorry. And their attitude totally changed yeah. um to that it's I, and I so I think that's sort of like what it was so mm -hmm. yeah it's I think a lot of RMTs don't realize that and I think we have a really unique situation where we can be really honest um with our clients and patients um I mean most people understand that if they miss like a like a physical with their doctor they're on the hook for whatever it is like 40 or 80 or whatever it is right and no mm -hmm. one has any problem with that um but for us it's like different you know what I mean mm -hmm. um so I think we sort of, a lot of, I know a lot of RMTs who struggle with that one in particular. Um, yeah. And I know if you work at a clinic, I can, I can, uh, uh, like, I can be pretty certain that you probably have a clinic owner or um, um, a boss who also hates enforcing it. Um, so that's sort of a clinic owner expectation that mm -hmm. I have a qualm with. So as a clinic owner, I decided I was going to have a different expectation. <laughs> for that yeah. uh, whole thing. Thanks for hanging out today for episode one of To Have a Boss or To Be the Boss. If you know someone who would enjoy this podcast as much as you did, be sure to send them the link. You can also spread more love by sharing a screenshot of this episode on your Instagram stories and tag at Rivers RMT. We would also be thrilled if you subscribe to the MTP family. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, please leave us a review or you can leave us a voice memo on Anchor. We'd love to hear from you. See you on our next episode. Be kind and be well. Be well.